registered for tonight's event, you were asked a series of questions. And one of those questions was, what do you love most about Minnesota? For me, the answer was the people. And you've heard from some amazing people this evening. Some of these people I have fallen in love with tonight, the work that they're doing. And it leads me to think about the tipping point that we are at. We are at a tipping point for greatness in our city, in our region, and in our state. But every day in my work, I run across a barrier to that tipping point. And that is often young people, especially in the technology world, are leaving this place to maybe make their mark in the world somewhere else. Often it's Boston or Silicon Valley, maybe Portland or Seattle. And it makes me sort of scratch my head and wonder what's it going to take to make sure that people stay here, especially young leaders stay here, and that they build our community further. And as I've thought about this, I've thought a little bit about the work that I've done engaging people in community over a number of years, but then also the work of others. And someone that I turn to again and again in my life is a researcher named Robert Putnam. Putnam's at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And Putnam has studied something uh, kind of unique in the civic space. He's actually been studying megachurches. And that, that would be a church where over 2,000 people attend a service in one weekend. It's kind of a mind-boggling statistic. But Putnam doesn't study the mega church to study churches. He studies it to wonder how could we learn from these mega churches to engage people more in the civic space and to be able to learn what do they do differently. One of the things that mega churches do really well is that they engage different populations. Younger people, they engage new immigrants better than others, and they do this in many different ways. But one of their key characteristics, besides breaking down barriers to attending the church, like sometimes you even see valet parking, and you can have your coffee and not even go in, into the church service. But the important piece of it, the most important piece, is the creation of cells, or the creation of cells of like a honeycomb, the structure that exists. This is important because it breaks this down into smaller groups where people can really connect to one another and make things more meaningful. Of course, this is not a new analogy to any of us, to break things down into smaller parts, to understand the whole, but tonight, I want us to think about how we could do this better in the Twin Cities, in our region, in Minnesota, and how we could make maybe a little more engagement around these smaller pieces. So when I've thought about this, I've also thought about the economic development theory that's been made famous by Michael Porter. Michael Porter's at the Harvard Business School, and Porter's theory is called the cluster theory, a lot like a honeycomb. And it has to do with how things thrive, how, how particular industries in particular grow up and come together, but also you can apply this to communities as well. I think it has really five characteristics that are important to share with you. It's based on the clustering together of these things, the proximity together. It's based on the supply chains and the sort of feeding of that network that's clustered together. How does it get its energy? How does it supply to one another? What does it be, what's it able to create off of it as well? It fosters both collaboration and competition, another important factor to be thinking about. So when we take these two ideas together, Putnam, as well as thinking about Porter, we can think about here in Minnesota what's happening and where we really thrive at this. So a few examples for you to really get your, your head around tonight. Healthcare technology. This is a great example of where Minnesota is thriving right now. Partly because we're good at some things. We're good at delivering healthcare. You can think of the great healthcare names that are there. You can think of the great medical device names that are there. But we also have this core competency in technology and those together they create this healthcare technology field that's booming right now, right here, because of this. Breaking down the smaller, but making a whole and making it hum. 
education and educational technology. We are known for great education, but together with technology, we have some real competency here. Anyone ever play Oregon Trail? Of course, of course you did. I did too. I think all through sixth grade I played Oregon Trail. And that was made right here in Minnesota. We've come a long way since Oregon Trail in terms of educational technology, and it's pretty exciting to see. Food and agriculture, an uh, area that, of course, we think of every day in the state. And then I like the nonprofit community as well. We have excellence in nonprofits right here. It's something we're known for. You know, we're the land of over 10,000 lakes. Pretty sure we're the land of our, over 10,000 nonprofits as well, right here in Minnesota. And it's not an accident. It's because we are good at governance, we know how to do this well, and so many organizations, whether it's an organization on your block or it's an organization doing its work globally, like the Center for Victims of Torture, that's an organization that does their work globally but based here in Minnesota. The American Refugee Committee, another organization doing global work based here, but because of that concentration of nonprofits, which is really important to build that honeycomb and, and make sure that, that it's, it's thriving. Now, I want to go back to megachurches for a second, because just studying the structure alone won't do it for me and probably wouldn't do it for you. There's another piece of this that Putnam talks about. The other major factor is that anyone who attended a megachurch for the first time did it for the reason that they received an invitation. They received an invitation from a family member, from a friend, maybe it was even just an acquaintance they ran into in the grocery store. And that invitation is powerful. You have to think about what that means. That means that someone's extending it and someone's accepting it. And so I would love for us to think together about how invitation has changed our own life or made an impact on our life. I'd like to share three examples with you where the power of invitation changed my life for the better and really opened up things for me. So some 25 years ago, when I moved from the farm and the college, small town college I went to in Minnesota to the Twin Cities, shortly thereafter, David and I bought a home in the Bryn Mawr neighborhood. And uh, in the neighborhood, there was a very active neighborhood group. And I don't even remember who it was, if it was Jay Peterson or Dick Adair or Kevin, Kevin of Munich, who were the first people to invite us to a neighborhood association meeting. Now we went and we were very interested in learning about the neighborhood, the neighborhood association. But you know, out of that relationship, some 25 years later, three houses later, two kids later, three dogs later, and a lot of friends and tools and help when things weren't going well, that power of that invitation was a really sticky one for me in my life. A few years later, I'd receive an invitation from neighbors, and the invitation was to run for office. Now you're thinking I'm going to say the House of Representatives, and you've already heard how that ends, but it wasn't. I was actually invited, and so was David separately, to run for the Minneapolis City Council. Now, those of you who read my bio know I never served on the Minneapolis City Council. You're right. You're wondering why. Did she run and lose? No, I was seven months pregnant. That 17-year-old is sitting here tonight. So I was a little busy, and it wasn't good timing to do that. But my neighbors kept pushing. They kept inviting me, and they invited me to run for the House of Representatives. I did that and had 12 great years there that I really enjoyed. After I left office, I had a new invitation, and that was to engage in the community differently. And the invitation I want to focus on was the invitation to join the Greater Twin Cities United Way Board. This is something that for me has become very powerful because the United Way has a mission to help people with a pathway out of poverty. So this organization for me is one of the representations of tackling some of the toughest problems we have right now in our region. The educational opportunity gap the poverty issues that we face. Particularly interesting to me is how African American men who have served in prison and have done their time and come out have a really difficult time finding employment. In fact, it's an understatement to say that. The impact that that has on their lives to not be able to provide for themselves, their family, their self-worth, and their meaning 
is something that we have to work on in this community. And that invitation to join the United Way Board provides me a way to do that. So the invitation is just the first step. And I have to acknowledge right here and now that it's not always easy after you accept or extend an invitation what happens next. In fact, it's not all downhill. It can be very uphill. It can be like scaling the rock wall, the rock face. Some of these problems that you've heard about this evening, they're tough and they're hard. And my advice to you is to take it one step at a time. It can be slippery and steep, and sometimes you even have to hold the hand of the person that you're next to to be able to make it. You may even fall backwards from time to time, but the act of doing this is the important thing. Now, the other thing that I want to stress about climbing this rock wall is that the reason to be involved in the community. A lot of things you see written will say, do it because it helps your resume or your job or it you know, just makes you feel better. Some of those things are true, actually. But I'm going to make a different statement to you tonight. I want you and I want you to extend invitations and do things in the community because it's best for the community. There's an intrinsic value, and there's actually research that shows that doing something for the sake of your community is actually the most important reason to do it at all. And you will have the most happiness by doing it that way. And so I want to give you a couple examples that had tough sledding in the last couple of years here, but they're fun examples and ones we can relate to tonight. So first is food trucks. Now, when the idea of food trucks came up in the Twin Cities and in Minneapolis and St. Paul specifically, it was illegal. It was just downright illegal to roll your truck up on the, next to the sidewalk, open the window, and start selling food out of it. And of course, thank goodness that there was a group of people who wanted to start the business of food trucks, but also a community that had seen it at other places and wanted to eat out of food trucks. And that made a very powerful combination of changing ordinances, changing state law, being able to make that change. You know, they even have the, the great uh, at Min Food Trucks, I believe, is the, uh, is the Twitter handle. And of course, we all enjoyed this tonight. Now, I like this example for a couple of reasons. It created a community around the people who were making the food trucks, the people who advocated for the changes around the food trucks. Those were more kind of long-lasting communities. And then it creates temporary community through this invitation. And we all experienced that tonight. By walking out to the street, getting our food, everyone was looking at each other's food. Did you notice this? And that was totally acceptable. That's like not against the social norm. You're sort of looking, hmm, what is that? What are you having? And then we sat down with complete strangers and ate a meal. And I think that is a really cool thing. The other movement, of course, is the craft brew movement here in Minnesota. And, you know, I had to say to Dustin, I was very excited because Brow Brothers Moo Juice is one of my favorite beers. So when I'm done, that's what I'm going to be having tonight. And so when I think about the craft brew movement, they had a hurdle too. And it was a big hurdle because it battled 100 years of liquor law in the state of Minnesota to make this happen. So it seems hard sometimes as you get invited and you join in or you extend the invitation, but I want to tell you that I think it's an important activity to join into. So now I want you to look under your chairs. I have something for you. I knew it was going to get noisy for a couple of seconds. In this envelope is an invitation. It's an invitation with some things that I've picked out for you. Now, they are civic-minded. I am that sort of person. And I realize that it might not hit the mark for all of you. But you might think about being an election judge this year in the city of Minneapolis, or helping a student, or doing something on the Bee Pollen Network, which is a great online networking community. Yay, Bee Pollen. <laughs> I can tell we have some members of the hive right here. And maybe you all will be. So here's what I'd ask you, that you in the next few days take just a little bit of time. Go through the list. Make up something of your own that you're committed to and get involved in the next six months. 
But I didn't stop there. I thought it was important that we practice inviting people, extending the invitation. So you actually have two invitations in this envelope. One to give to someone else. Because part of building leadership and part of asking people to stay and make their mark is making room for the new leaders, is making room for people to have their own chance to lead, not just seeing the same old people at the top of the leadership ladder. I want you to all be part of this as well. And so that's why I give you the invitation tonight. Now, I know that we can bridge the differences that we have. We can bridge and scale the big problems we have in this state. This is a great community. This is a great state. And I invite you this evening to commit to stay and make a difference right here. Thanks so much.